Thousands of British residents remain stranded in India, having previously been told that they would be flown home. The British government says it's brought back more than 16,000 travellers and last week announced a further five specially chartered flights. But critics say that's just not enough. Karen Franklin was encouraged to buy tickets for a repatriation flight. She's in Tamil Nadu in southern India, but has since been informed that she isn't eligible. She doesn't know when she and her children will be reunited with her husband, Joshua, who is an NHS surgeon in Plymouth. Also with us this morning is Tan Manjeet Singh Desi, who is the Labour MP for Slough, who's been overwhelmed, he says, by constituents in similar situations. Uh, thank you all very much for talking to us. Uh, let me start with you, Joshua. When your wife and children were unable to get their scheduled flight home, did the British government say that they should book a repatriation flight? Uh, thanks for uh, having me online. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see me. Is I it... can see you. Yes, welcome. All right. All right, perfect. So uh, again, thanks for having me online. So uh, to be honest, uh, the, the British government uh, sent out an official letter telling us that these flights, uh, which serve to repatriate British residents and citizens, were meant for all of us. It's an official letter. It's not something that was passed on the great point, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, subsequently, we were informed that flights from southern India were departing on the 20th of April, and we were encouraged to book on those flights. We booked on the flights. We got a reply telling us to pack our bags and be ready. And once they figured out the logistics, they'll pick us up 12 to 24 hours before the flights, pending final checks and confirmations. So we had all our bags packed and ready, and then unfortunately no one turned up. And we heard, I think, a week or so later that... Uh, and this is just on social media that there are no more flights. And I think last week they sent us an official email saying that we were never eligible for these flights at all, which is in direct contradiction to the first set of government of official uh, uh, correspondence with us, which told us that these flights were for all of us. Let me ask and Karen then. Sorry, let me bring in Karen. And how did you feel at that point when you were told, Karen, that you were no longer eligible? Ah, so it, were, it really was a roller coaster of emotion. We started off getting excited um, on the 10th of April, waited out till the 20th. They were giving out the emails 24 hours prior to know if we were uh, had secured a seat on the flight. So we'd assumed, you know, we, our chances were good. Um, and then it was a matter of checking spam in your inbo inbox for 24 hours. And then ultimately you find out uh, you didn't make the flight. So it was, uh, it was disappointing, to say the least. To say the least. You were supposed to fly back, I understand, on March the 23rd. When did you and the children last see Joshua in person? Um, the end of Jan. So we were supposed to meet after, I think, 45 days. Uh, we uh, decided to stay behind. Our family is here. Um, so we decided we'd see. And the 23rd of March was not uh, very far away. So we booked on the British Airways flight uh, out of Chennai and I was traveling with uh, a then 10 month old. She's going to turn one now and our five year old son. So, And how, uh, do, we you were... how do you feel that the Foreign Office, the British Foreign Office have dealt with this? Well, well, to be honest, um, I think what they're doing, it's a, it's a huge effort uh, uh, going through. Uh, I mean, they have a lot of obstacles to cross. And I appreciate that, but I feel like there could have been a lot more communication so that one wouldn't have to go through uh, the feeling of giving hope and then taking it away. I think that was um, unfair. Uh, it would have been better to know right from the start that uh, probably it wasn't meant for us. And then, you know, I would, I may not have pursued it or sort of, it's, uh, so we spent, so from the May uh, 23rd of March till uh, April 20th, we kept our bags uh, packed. So. I think uh, that anticipation of having to leave, explaining to my son that uh, we aren't going. And I think if there was just communication right from the start, I, I think it would have been a lot better. Well, I mean, can I, but, but Karen, why are you not eligible? I don't understand. Uh, neither, neither do I. But apparently, I mean, if you do, I, said, I mean, if you do come across like the email I uh, got last week, uh, I was told, I'm sorry, you do not fit into the criteria. We are taking you off the wait list. So essentially, I have to now rely on 
hoping that the you know the Indian government might open up some flights for us. Okay. So it's Le Joshua, do you have any idea why your wife and children are suddenly not eligible? Um, uh, unfortunately, not because the, the first set of official correspondence from the government was that we're all eligible, as in. It, and it's not even ambiguous. It's they clearly mention British citizens and residents, and I think much in keeping with the rest of the government, they set out ambitious targets, and when they can't meet it, they either change the rules or they change the goalpost altogether. So we haven't been told why. Uh, they started off officially telling us that we're all uh, going to be on these flights, and then I think when they realized that it was probably going to be tough, they didn't even bother telling us. They just, uh, as in telling us individually, they just. Uh, sent out a few Twitter feeds saying these flights are meant only for citizens. Right, okay. So the, 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 the significance here is that Karen is a UK resident. Is that right? Yes, she yes. is a resident uh, with, I think, we have two years left on our visas. We have sure. a thousand. I mean, no, I, I'm not, yeah, you've got, you've got uh, leave to remain for another couple of years. Let me just read this. Uh, statement from the Foreign Office. We know it's a difficult time for many British travellers abroad. We've flown back over 30,000 on specially chartered planes, including over 13,500 from India and have helped over a million Brits return on commercial flights. Our staff will continue working around the clock to bring British travellers home. Uh, let me bring in uh, the MP, Mr Desi. Good morning to you. Um, what's going morning, on here? What, what's, what's the issue? Well, we cannot simply abandon these people, our people, uh, and uh, you know, it, it, I think it's highly hypocritical of the, uh, of the Prime Minister and the government every single week in front of the cameras. They're out there clapping for our uh, National Health Service staff, clapping for our key workers. And let me remind the Prime Minister and the government that these are key workers. These are NHS staff and it is our parents and grandparents generation that have come to this country and have helped to rebuild the country, helped to uh, staff and build the NHS. And now now the government is trying to wash their hands of them and as um, uh, Joshua and Karen have very eloquently highlighted the guidance has been changed halfway through the goalposts have been moved and it, it, it's, it's not enough for government ministers to be waxing lyrical day in day out about the commonwealth and the wonderful relationship that they have well look, these uh, individuals who came to the UK and some by the way uh, Victoria have been living here for decades they have lived worked and paid taxes here they have been uh, an and made an immense contribution to our community and our society. And it, it is at this very point that uh, they have now gone uh, in a, on a holiday and now they deserve to be brought back. We, you know, has the government learned nothing from the Windrush scandal? Well, is this another Windrush? Well, in, in essence, it is because if those individuals, if they've got an Indian or Pakistani passport or if they've got a, a European uh, Union passport, if they have been living here, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, sometimes for decades on end, uh, just because of the colour of their passport, if they are permanent British residents, then they deserve the, the, the very best from our government. They need to be looked after. They cannot be abandoned because they have indefinite leave to remain. Uh, and if they have made that contribution over all of those decades, and, and, and let's not forget that it's not just them that are NHS workers. Sometimes, as is uh, the case here with Joshua, it's their children or their uh, partners or their grandchildren who are now living and working uh, as NHS staff. And many of those, by the way, are British citizens, as in they have got British passports, but some of the older generation who, uh, who are now stranded out there. Uh, and I've, got, I've had cases whereby the elderly are fast running out of medicine and they are saying, look, the guidance before was that we were going to be looked after. Mm. I was under that same uh, the, you know, misconception because that's what I read. I read the government guidance. And now we owe it to those people, to our people, to bring them back home. 